that. This is for you. And if you're a Christian who doesn't struggle with that and know perhaps this is for you because there are Christians sat all around you tonight who, who have and who do. And they're going to need your help. And we're here for each other, so we want to be equipped to assist each other and help. So let's, let's just read a few words here from Hebrews chapter 3. The author to the Hebrews is writing to you Christians. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, and here are the two words that are going to be springboard into our sermon tonight. Consider Jesus. That's what I want to, to be ringing in your ears as you leave. Consider Jesus. And I want us to answer a simple question. Is Jesus worth trusting? There's no more foundational question that we could ask this evening. All of our hope as Christians rests on the reliability of Jesus. Uh, a week and a half ago I was fishing before the flood um, and I was out with Josh McKenzie and I hadn't noticed there was this big branch over the top of my head and I cast my line out and I got wrapped right around the tree. It was one of those awful ones, you know, you know when you, you, your lure just whizzes around and around the branch and you think there's no way I'm getting that out. But Josh being a man show Southlander, he turns around and says, I'll get it. Walks his over with his muscles over towards the tree and reaches up for the branch. But as soon as he puts his weight on it, the whole tree came down and, and into the river. If Jesus isn't reliable, if he can't carry the weight of our souls into eternity, then our faith has no credible foundation. And unless we're prepared to live a lie, we have to abandon. Jesus and we have to abandon Christianity. You imagine you're feeling along a, a chain made of steel links and you come to one that's made out of fishing line. You know that that's the point that you've got to strain, that you've got to test to see if the chain will hold. If it holds at that point, you know the chain will hold, it's secure. Where's the weak link in Jesus? Where's the point that we've got to stress and strain in order to determine his reliability. Uh, if, there's, if there's any weak point in Jesus, it's his life on earth. It's when he adds human nature to his divine nature, because it's at that point that we're able to, to scrutinize him. He's vulnerable, he's investigable. It's then that we can scrutinize and ask, is he really divine? That's what... What matters, isn't it? Is he really God? If his life is exceptional, if it's a fantastic life, but not a unique life, not a godly life, not a transcendent life, if he's just a great man, we can be sure that Jesus and the system of belief that rests on him is a waste of faith. So is Jesus truly unique? But well, I want to give you several answers to that question. Number one, Jesus' birth was unique. Lots of parents today do gender reveals to tell you what the, the gender of the baby is going to be but they're not always right and even ultrasound scans can be interpreted incorrectly the birth of Jesus was prophesied hundreds of times thousands of years before he was born and yet all of those prophecies were fulfilled even really precise details like that he would be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, in exile in Egypt, raised in Nazareth, in the family line of David. Now, a, a much more intelligent man than me, Professor Peter Stoner, he's chairman of Departments of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College and Westmont College in California. He's worked out the probability of somebody being able to fulfill eight, just eight specific prophecies from, from time past, just by coincidence, just happenstance, just chance fulfilling eight prophecies. Here's the number. It's one in ten to the seventeen. So that's one hundred with let me count that three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen zeros after the hundred. I think that number is one hundred quadrillion. And that's just eight of the prophecies. Now, because I'm not a mathematician, I'm very thankful because Dr. Son has gone further to put that into real terms. And he says it's the equivalent of covering the whole state of Texas, which is 268,000 kilometers. That's two and a half New Zealands. So covering two and a half New Zealands with $2 coins, two foot deep. 
and then, and then pushing a blind man out of an aeroplane at a random position over the country, him landing and picking up the one coin out of all of them that you marked on his first attempt. That's just eight prophecies. And yet Jesus fulfills over 300. His life, his existence, his birth in our world, fulfilling all those prophecies is an utterly unique miracle. His existence in the flesh. It's an incredible thing. Then Jesus' behavior was unique. Well, Jesus did things that nobody else did. He dared to criticize those that nobody else would criticize. The established religious and social authorities who've become corrupt and self-centered. He approached uh, people who nobody else would approach. When he was approached by a rich, wealthy, intelligent young man that everybody would want on their team, Jesus sent him away son. And yet he welcomed little children and said, don't, don't hinder them for to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. Jesus befriended untouchables like a promiscuous Samaritan woman that Tim told us about a couple of weeks ago. A, a man born blind who everybody in the town said was, was suffering for the consequence of his, of his parents' sin. He associated with undesirables, traitorous tax collector called Zacchaeus, a, a terrorist named Simon, rough, hard-living fisherman. Jesus cared for the, the unlovable, the demon-possessed man who was so feared in his hometown that he'd been forced to live in a graveyard and was left there to cut himself with rocks. <coughs> a, a woman who's bleeding had, had left her socially ostracized and along lepers who'd been pushed away from civilized towns, forced to live in caves and wear rags and feel the agony of seeing their family at a, at a distance, never able to, to put their arms around them, watching their wives struggle along through life and seeing their kids and never able to, to wrap them up in their arms because you couldn't touch an unclean person. And yeah, here's Jesus. And he puts his hands on them. And he lets them feel his warmth. And lets them know that, that he cares. Jesus defends the defenseless and stands between a, a woman and a firing squad who are ready to crack a skull open with the, the rocks in their hands. It's not a remarkable life. It's a life of unfathomable beauty. Nobody behaved like Jesus. Then Jesus' actions are you. See, not only did he come alongside these people, listen to their concerns, not only did he let them know that he cared, but he healed them. He healed them. His life is full of miracles. There are miracles all over nature. Just read of him walking on, on water. Another time he calmed the storm of the world. He healed sickness, reversed degenerative disease. He cured what no doctor could cure. He made the skin of lepers new. He made blind eyes see. He made atrophied legs to walk. He even brought people back from the dead. Then there were miracles over the supernatural. He exercised demons, sent a, a thousand of them scuttling off into a herd of pigs. And none of this was done in the dark, was it? It was out in the open for everyone to see. He wasn't a magician who put up a curtain and then did some trickery behind it and then pulled the curtain down and, and hey, the guy's better. But actually, his twin brothers just snuck in. <laughs> there was none of that. Everything was out in the open. Let me test your Bible knowledge now. We've got some smart people in who are well read here. Let's see how good they are. How many people, or let's be specific according to the scriptures, how many men were present when Jesus fed the 5,000? Oh, very good. Yeah, you can tell we're a very intelligent church here. 5,000. And how about when you fed the 4,000? 4,000. Now, I said I'm not a mathematician, but I think I can do that. That's 9,000 people uh, at two different events in two goals. 9,000 people watched as he took that bread and split it and split it and split it and the fish and broke it, broke it. And it fed that huge crowd. And then there is other miracles that are always done in front of disciples and crowds of people who, who could be there in the first century and, and see as the gospels being put together and, and say, no, it didn't happen like that. And yet that doesn't happen. The accounts could be verified and critiqued. And Jesus does it all out in the open. And it's not criticized. Who else has ever done what Jesus did? 
there are some incredible illusionists and magicians and mentalists in the world today but we know that what they do is tricks there's Darren Brown in the UK he's brilliant at, at what he does and there's one time that he predicted the, the lottery numbers and so he wrote them down in a, in a piece of paper put in an envelope and then the numbers were called and then he takes out his envelope takes out the numbers and then write numbers but he never would let you look in that envelope before the numbers were called <laughs> because Darren Brown didn't know what the numbers were if he did he'd win the lottery every week and then there are faith healers, like Bill Johnson at the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. Don't trust him, one inch. Not when he reads his Bible through his glasses and, and follows the text with fingers struck together because he's broken one of them. These are entertainers at best, con men at worst. You use their charisma for personal gain. Jesus uses his power for the glory of God and the good of others. Nobody did what Jesus did. And then nobody spoke like Jesus spoke. A, a hallmark on a ring tells you at least three things about it. It tells you its origin, where it's come from, it, its quality, and its purity. Those three stamps on the inside tell you all that. Josh, you just got married. Oh, then you, got a, you got a ring on there. You just looked on the inside. There's no stamps, and you're worried about it. <laughs> That's right, those three stamps, they tell you where it's from, how good it is, and how pure it is. Three hallmarks, let me give you them, of Jesus' words, his preaching, its origin. You know why Jesus' preaching drew in the crowds? Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, 29. So you know that Matthew chapter 7 is right at the end of the, the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5, 6, 7, we've got that big, long sermon of Jesus. And then right at the end, verse 28, we read these words. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribe. See, the teachers and the lawyers, they were explaining and they were interpreting God's word. They gave their opinions on it that they could tell you about what all these different rabbis had to say about specific texts and, and specific chapters and specific books. But Jesus spoke with the authority of God himself. He didn't have to appeal to anybody else for support. Have a look just a few pages earlier at Matthew chapter 5 and, and verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus does what nobody else does. But I say to you, he speaks with his own authority. But I say to you, verse 40, if anyone would sue you and take your tune, let him take your cloak as well. And he speaks with this authority. When he says, but I say to you. Jesus didn't explain or interpret God's word. He declares it. And then he shows that it reaches far beyond everything that the, the lawyers and Pharisees are, are saying. He taught that adultery doesn't begin with casual sex sleeping around behind your, your, your husband or wife's back, but it begins with fools, lustful thinking. He taught that hating somebody is as good as, as murder long before you put the knife in their back. And so Jesus speaks with a gravity that only God himself can, can speak with. Then we see the quality of Jesus' words. They're beautiful. He speaks with such an empathy and a compassion and majesty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. This is his I am statement. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's teaching in John 10 on the nature of the, the good shepherd. His high priestly prayer in John 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. He's a transcendent word. Now you understand that Jesus is speaking 2,000 years ago. And so all of his teaching, it isn't the distillation of all the great philosophical musings of history. This is the son of a Galilean carpenter speaking like this. Who else in history spoke like Jesus? In the last 200 years, brilliant minds have grappled with complex issues and they offer us theories 
on living a fulfilled existence. They say, do this and, and behave this way uh, and act in this way uh, and then you'll live the life that you're meant to live and you'll find purpose. Jesus doesn't speak like that at all. He says, Matthew 11, 28, hear these words, come to me. He says that. He says, don't go here, don't go there, don't think this way, don't do that, but come to me. All who labour and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Nobody else has ever spoken like that. I mean, who would dare have the audacity to say, come to me and you will find rest. For your soul, you'll find the peace that you are aching to find. You won't find that in Kant or Nietzsche or Sartre or Freud or Camus or Wilde. Kierkegaard does nothing to say like that. They wouldn't dare make such claims. All they offer you is more questions. But Jesus has the solution. His words are of unparalleled quality. And then their purity. I read an article last week. Um, titled Why Freud Still Matters Even Though He Was Wrong About Almost Everything. <laughs> See, even, even great minds are eventually proven to be false. Uh, and, and even those who cling rigorously, religiously to Darwin's doctrines still accept that the hints of racism and the push towards eugenics that follows from that are okay to ditch. Jesus says, Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And there are more people today on the planet than, than ever before testifying that Jesus' words never fail. And after 2,000 years of severe testing where men and women have spent their lives trying to attack and disprove and discredit Jesus' words, still they stand immovably strong and all these hammers are, are worn out on the anvil of Jesus' word. Nobody spoke like him. Then Jesus' love is unique. Jesus loved like nobody ever loved. Went out of his way to show care and concern. And then he shows this uniquely deep love for his disciples. When on the doorstep of death, John 13, 1, having loved them, he loved them to the end. In other words, Jesus' love for his people was so great, he, he wouldn't give up right at the finish line but he was going to go all the way through even into the darkest part of his mission he loved his people to death and, and we see that so clearly at the last supper where jesus is hours away from being dragged up golgotha and nailed to the cross and yet he's concerned about comforting his disciples john 14 1 he's saying do not let your hearts be troubled that's what they should have been saying to him right He's about to be crucified. And they should have been listening to what he'd been saying. And they should have understood this was coming. And they should have been there to put their arms around him and say, Master, don't let your heart be troubled. And yet he's the one going to the cross. And he's saying to his boys, Lads, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. Many rooms. If it weren't so, I'd have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And then the clearest revelation of Jesus' love is the cross itself. John 15, 13. Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friend. But then Jesus goes on to demonstrate at the cross a love that surpasses the greatest human love. Love of God. He, he lays down his life, not for his friends, but for his enemies. Nobody loved like Jesus. Jesus' death was unique. The centurion who stood there superintending Jesus' execution was a man who knew death. And being a centurion, having achieved that rank, meant that he had seen war. He had experienced battle in the ancient world. And this wasn't the, the battle of Monday, buttons pressed from miles away. He'd had comrades die in his arms, he'd had enemies die on his sword. And now he's posted to an execution squad in Palestine where death is his 
daily job. And so he's seen all sorts of deaths. He's seen criminals go to their death screaming and cursing. He's seen strong men who led rebellions and stuck their nose out against Caesar and defied him, who have fallen apart and crumbled at the sight of those long iron nails. This is a man who has seen death in all of its forms, but as Jesus dies, he witnesses something totally new. He sees a man who's not a soldier, who's not a revolutionary, he's a religious seeker. And yet he goes to his death without complaint, without cursing, without calling on God to nuke the Romans off the face of the planet. This is a man who, who even refuses to take the anaesthetic drink offered by the, the humanitarian women of Jerusalem. He's seen this man refusing to rise to the ridicule of his enemies as they just heap insults on him, but instead pushes down on those nails to gulp in enough air to speak words of love to his mum and pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Nobody died like Jesus. And so the centurion declares, Mark 15, 39, surely this man was the Son of God. And then Jesus' resurrection was unique. American lawyer, very gifted, talented lawyer named Frank Morrison, felt that he owed his, his skills to the world. He knew how to handle evidence. He knew what to do with it. He knew how to rip it apart and how to make a case from it. And he felt that he owed it to the world to use his abilities, his skills, to prove once and for all that the resurrection didn't happen and Christianity was, was based on a lie. He was going to write a book and put this all down and the first chapter of that book is called The Book That Refused To Be Written. Because Morrison's book called Who Moved the Stone ended up arguing that the resurrection was undeniably true. See, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is, is so concrete, there's no realistic alternative. And what's more, for six weeks after he rose, Jesus was seen by people, over 500 people, seeing Jesus. It was exactly as the angels had announced in Matthew 28, verse 6. He's not here. He's risen. Nobody rolls like Jesus. Now maybe you've been sat there and you've been listening and you've been pondering this question. Why have we spent all of our time tonight speaking about the uniqueness of Jesus when Hayden carefully stressed again and again very clearly for us that the topic was doubt? Did you forget that, Jeff, and got off on a tangent? I can tell you a story I've told you a number of times before, but I was in Birmingham in the UK. I was walking in the street and I saw a little table with a missionary group of Muslim guys. To the side. And, and I, I, it's like a magnet for me. I just think these people will have a conversation with me. So straight up, so I went up and started talking. And immediately, the Muslim guy wanted me to talk to him about the Trinity and explain how I could believe in something as ridiculous as one God in three persons. And so we were talking about that and discussing it. And I said, "Look, I can take you so far down this road and explaining why I believe this, but the reality is there's going to come a point where." I have to say, I don't understand anymore. I believe one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before time, loving each other. That simple little analogy that sort of got everything in there. But I said, you know, there's going to come a point where I can't explain everything, but then that's the way it should be because we're talking about God. And if I understood everything about God, then I would have a problem because an infinite God could suddenly fit into a finite mind. If I can understand everything about God, he's, he's not God. And the guy looked at me and he kind of sniggered and scoffed. And I said, well, are you telling me that you can understand everything there is to know about, about Allah? He said, yep. I said, no. <laughs> That's a big problem. See, Christianity is an ocean. And it's got lovely, safe, warm shallows. And it's got some very, very deep trenches. And in those trenches, there is treasure. But in order to get to the treasure, there are a lot of weeds and rocks and pressure and cold. And as you explore the deep things of God, you will find that there are a lot of questions that come up, but not necessarily a lot of answers. And when questions mount up, there is a danger, because as they pile up, it can be the case that all we see is questions and they obstruct our view of the way back into the shallows. 
We forget how to get back there. The pile of questions grows and it blinds us to even the most fundamental truths and we become worried about things like the, the reality of a seven or six day creation or the origin of God or the role of predestination or the horror of hell. And these things pile up when we start to ask questions we thought we'd never ask, like, is it all real? Now maybe that's you. Maybe you're like a lot of Christians who find yourself in that position on the odd occasion. Maybe when circumstances or, or when your emotional or physical or mental health takes a, a dive, that's when all those doubts flood in and swamp the first truths that you loved when you became a Christian. Perhaps you've never been a Christian and all you've got is, is doubt. You've never had answers. Whatever situation you're in, whatever doubt you face, the reason that we've given all of our time to thinking about the uniqueness of Jesus is because the best thing that I can do for you is preach the uniqueness of Christ. The greatest gift that, that I can give is to stir your affections with the worthiness of Christ because it's in Jesus that we find the answer to all of our doubts. He is the cure-all to whatever doubt we face. And so when I'm stricken with that question, does God really exist? Have I just been living a lie? Have I just been brainwashed by well-meaning parents who took me to church every week and, and now I'm, I'm believing this, but, but is it really true? Or if I wonder, could God really love me when I keep going back to my sin? Or I'm, I'm oppressed with worries about the future or the past or the nature of God and I can't help asking, is this true? When that happens, I run to Jesus. And there I see that there was a man who walked on this earth and he was unlike any other man. He was born like no other man. He behaved like no other man. Taught like no other man. Loved like no other man. Died like no other man and rose from the dead like no other man. And I must come to the conclusion as I look at the life of Jesus and his uniqueness that he is not just a man but here is my God. A God who is real. A God who speaks, who heals and who loves me even to the point of death. See, whatever uncertainty you face regarding Christianity, whether you doubt, whatever doubt you, you have, or, or, or however it surfaces or however strong it feels, the answer is Jesus. But how can we make that a practical thing? And how do we remember Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1? Consider Jesus. I want to split this in two ways. Talk first about thinking doubts. Took Daniel on an adventure every now and then. I'll say to Daniel, Shall we go on an adventure? He gets excited about that. And we went to the river behind the race course. And, and we got there and he was very, very excited because the first thing that we came upon was just a field of, of pebbles. You know, there's pebbles everywhere and he likes stamping on the rocks and it makes a noise. And, and what I managed to do is get him quite close to the river without him even noticing that the river was there. I got him close and I picked him up and with his back to the river, walked really close and then I suddenly turned him around and I said, Look, Dan, a river. And his little face, mouth drops up. <laughs> and this thing's just flying, you know, it's, it's not even a tower, but it's flogged. It wasn't the flood before the flood. It wouldn't have gone down there. But it's just coursing along, and there's that silent kind of power of a river, isn't there? It just moves, and nothing can, nothing can stop. He's just looking at it. And then I put him down on his feet, and he took a couple of steps back. And when he realized I wasn't next to him anymore, ran straight back to Dan and grabbed onto my leg. As you and I learn to, to swim in the ocean of theology, in, the, in the, the, the sea of Christianity, and as we start exploring and, and seeking the treasure in God's Word, we begin where we're safe. So we start at the cross, because the cross is the most clear revelation of God's love for me and you. <coughs> We start at the place where the nails and the crown of thorns leave us with no doubt that we are signally loved by a unique Saviour. So we start where we're safe. 
And then we do what Daniel did. We start to loosen our grip a little bit, and we tiptoe closer to the river. And so we, we advance out of the shallows, and we start to explore. And as soon as we start to feel out of our depth, we turn around, and we come right back rush back to the cross and we fill our minds again with who our saviour is. We warm up in the shallows before we go exploring in the deep. But, but what about when our doubts are not thinking doubts? You understand what I'm saying there? You know, we, we explore with our mind, we read our books and as soon as we start to feel a bit uncomfortable, let me give you a real life example. I'm in, in university in, in my first year and, and somebody starts to explain to me Calvinism. And this is like a slap in the face. I don't know what this guy's talking about because we got to the third point and then I was in trouble. But it's almost like we could start exploring. So the first point, you know, man is totally depraved. No problem with that. We're all sinful and sin has affected every part of who I am. And so there's the first step. And then there's the second step, which is um, you for, for unconditional unconditional election. So God has chosen us based on nothing that we've done. It's his choice. And well, that makes sense because if I'm totally depraved and sin has affected every part of me, well then, yeah, I could follow that next step. Then came the L, limited atonement. God didn't die for everyone. Jesus didn't die for everyone on the cross. He died for those he's chosen. Whoa, back again to where I'm safe. And what I know, because that was just mind-blowing. I'm thinking, what about John 3.16? Where, where else am I going? And then, but eventually, seeing that I'm loved, I can make those steps further and further. And that's what you must do. When the doubt creeps we run back. But what about then when those doubts are, are not logical, but they're emotional? Because emotion might not be as intelligent a voice as logical doubt is, but it can very often be a louder voice. Emotion can drown out logic. What about when I know in my head, but I don't know in my heart? And when I, when I know God loves me, but I don't really feel that he could. Well, we still need to engage our heads but it's not longer it's no longer so much about reasoning as it is about remembering consider Jesus remember who he is and what he's done for you because if you're in that place where depression strikes and you just feel like you can't think straight anymore you can't reason clearly well can you remember can you remember just one point in the past when you were convinced then that Jesus loves you? Because if you can, well, he doesn't change. And so no matter how you feel in that moment, if you know at some point he loved you, he must still love you now. If you're prone to emotional dips, there are things that you can do practically that can help you. Journaling is not a bad idea. Recording the things that you've seen God do in your life. Keeping a, a diary of, of answered prayers so you can look back and say, look how far the Lord has brought me. Little Ebenezer's written down for it. Those things prove God's determination to be there for us. Special verses around your room is, is a great thing to have. So in Philippians 1.6, He who began a good work in you will see it to completion. Then another thing everybody who struggles with doubts at any point can do is use your church. Use the family that God has given you. Because maybe there's a Christian here, younger or older, who's already conquered that doubt that you're struggling with. Maybe God's given them something really helpful to answer the questions that they have. And maybe that older Christian needs to be encouraged by a younger Christian coming to them. And saying, hey, how have you got through this? And experience the joy of being able to share. Well, God brought me through it and he taught me this and he showed me this. That's why God makes us at church and puts us all at different places on that journey. So we learn, grow together as we learn together from Jesus. And here's the last thing I want to say to you. Next um, Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at the time when John the Baptist doubted. And I want to give you a little teaser now from Matthew chapter 11. So just turn there. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. You know, John has been preaching, he's been calling out the sin of people, he's called out the sin of King Herod, and it's landed in, in a dungeon. And although he heralded the coming of Jesus, he's now questioning as he sits in this dank gold cell. 
was he right? Was Jesus really the Lamb of God who came to take the sin of the world? Now John, verse 2, Now John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ. He sent word by his apostles and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell what you go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive the sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. If you're a Christian who struggles with that, the last thing I want to say to you is this. Don't beat yourself up over your doubts. Because John the Baptist doubted, and Jesus called him the greatest man who ever lived. But you take a tip from the greatest man who ever lived and do what he did. Take your doubts to Jesus. Consider Jesus. It's the answer to, to every doubt his people face. Let's pray. Father, your love for your people is so great. It's vast, it's broad, it's strong, it's undying, it's unchanging, everlasting. And you don't desire that we should spend our days handicapped by doubt. We thank you that you've also given us the answer to our doubt in, in sending your son the Lord Jesus into our world so that we could see in terms that we can we can grasp more easily who you are and what your heart is towards us we thank you Lord Jesus for your perfect life credited to us and we thank you for this this other way in which it helps us to walk with you, answering our doubts, giving us confidence that you really are the Lamb of God, come from heaven to take away the sins of the world. We pray that you'd help us when we struggle, when we have our questions, to fix our eyes on you, to consider your, your life, your words, your love, your death, your resurrection. And once again, finding you are all in all, we pray that you might be pray that you might be glorified in the lives of strong Christians who are faithful to you. We pray that you'd use us to help other believers, our brothers and sisters, who will inevitably struggle with doubts too. Give us grace that we might point them to Christ. Together we might consider Jesus and grow, going from strength to strength as we follow you. We pray in your name. Amen.